Is that the first time you've seen that, both of you, since the, since the moment in here, or have you revisited it? Well, I'm writing the novelisation right now, so okay. I know I've seen it. <laughs> how, how's that going? Um, well, I, I, I'll be, I've got one more week to write it, I think. And Is that the original deadline? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just kind of going back, um, and, and when you kind of first took over the, sort of the, <laughs> the gig, so to speak, as showrunner, did you know that this was going to be sort of fall under your jurisdiction at some point and is that something you'd be kind of working up for uh, up to over a period of time? Um, no, I did not know it would necessarily fall in, uh, in my time because although I now realise that was halfway through the time I did the job, I didn't know if I'd still be doing it by then. Mm. So uh, obviously I was. So I didn't, I didn't know. I knew that, you know, that we had to keep in mind and we all knew that it was going to fall on a Saturday, the 23rd. Um, and that, that it would be the very first time fans of dull facts will be delighted to know the Doctor Who's uh, anniversary show was shown on the right day. <laughs> do, you, do you know this about the Five Doctors? What? No, tell us about It was shown two days later. <laughs> because the children in need, and if you want to be really appalled, it was shown in America first. <laughs> yeah, the, that old show, they just catered for the American market the entire time. The classic series, I couldn't stand that. Yeah, it was shown in America first, on the 23rd. We got it two days. I'm still gross! <laughs> what, what you did achieve that the five doctors didn't is you got Tom Baker back. Uh, yes, well, in fairness, he'd been, he'd been away for a bit longer. I mean, at the time, I, I was, uh, remember, as a, as a kid, as, a, as an adult, I was seething with resentment that he hadn't, but I suppose in fairness, he'd only been away a short time. But uh, though, though David came back. Yeah. Yeah, David was more of a fanboy, so. <laughs> and I knew him. So I could corner him in my living room and say, please. And in the end, I mean, it ended up being... I mean, I say big budget. I mean, it, I mean, it wasn't big budget in the, in the scheme of things. If you were making... Uh, a, a movie, which essentially this is, for the sort of the general sort of sci-fi movie market. You're talking 100 million plus, probably, aren't you? Easily, and you made. The, I don't mean it's on record what what, what this is made for. That's it. Are you able to share that with us? Um, I don't know. I, I've signed many pieces of paper which say I have to keep my secrets with the BBC. Yeah. Even now, su suffice to say, it was not even close to that thing. <laughs> um, and most of my grey hairs are a result of reading Stephen's scripts. And this, is, <laughs> and this is this is money from the BBC and money from BBC Worldwide. So. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so they and so you knew at the start that this is something that could, that could be licensed and available in cinemas when you were writing it, or was that something that came later? No, we knew from the start that we yeah. wanted to have a, a cinema showings, but there was. There was no extension of mercy budget wise to that's just that was budgeted more or less like yeah. a normal Doctor Who. Yeah. And it was three D it, it was in three D. Yeah, that was the only extra bit of budget we got was yeah. from the three D fund. Yeah. Uh, otherwise it was budgeted very similar to a normal. And from, from your point of view as a producer, was there anything that Stephen wanted to do that you just had to say we just can't do it because it's just we just can't afford it? Uh, the memory's hazy. We we tried for most things. I mean the, the thing we always tried to do was if we, we applied the kind of criteria of if we'll only do it if we think we can do it well. Mm. And I think we were certainly pushing through the edge of the envelope on that one. Um, but no, we tried for everything. And, you know, all credit, particularly to Nick Hurran, the director, who was never afraid of anything that Stephen asked in the script. He would always go for it. He would always keep the bits in we'd cut. Yes. <laughs> He'd handwrite them on the back of the script. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the stuff we'd cut because we couldn't have time to schedule it on budget. Yeah. And he'd, he'd write it all down and handwriting on the back of the script so in case on the day he yeah. could <laughs> sneak it in. Yeah. Uh, he was brilliant for that. Yeah. The truth is with, uh, uh, with uh, the stuff that we cut from scripts, it would never be big spectacular stuff. We'd always, you know, Marcus yeah. would always get that done. It'd be something else like, okay, that scene in a restaurant, could that just be, could that just be in a small cupboard? That would be that. It'd be something you wouldn't notice. Uh, the cuts we'd make, not, not the big. Because it's honestly, I think when you watch it the first time, you're so kind of overwhelmed by the spectacle of it. You, you're not kind of certainly I'm not analysing it as I would do when you, when you revisit something. But yeah. actually, what what does come across is how many different locations and time zones and different um, people um, at, at different. You know, I mean, there's so much going on in this. And so many special effects. We found in Wales, very close to. <laughs> 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 and the other thing, of course, is that as much as you know, people who. Um, are kind of more, say, casual viewers for the show are going to be rewarded by watching this. There is a massive amount in there for the fans, isn't there? I mean, you've just, I mean, just so many kind of layers to it. There's a lot. I mean, there's a lot. The, the, the danger was, you know, we were going to present a piece of television that people who didn't normally watch Doctor Who were going to, were going to watch, God help them. And loads of my friends were saying, who, who because they're rubbish 
uh, didn't watch Doctor Who. He said, oh, I'm going to watch the 50th film. And I was thinking, good luck. <laughs> so I'm playing a younger version of Matt, Matt Smith. Don't worry about it. But they all understood it fine, bizarrely enough. It's by far, by far, I keep saying, the most complicated Doctor Who story ever told. Having to dig back into the, the plot again for the for the book version. It's, it's mad. There is no no correct order to tell that story. No, I remember you saying at the time, just follow the fairs and it will all make sense. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that actually applies. It does. Yeah. Do you know what? The one thing I was... I, I mean, I don't often like what I do, but I, I never like what I do, but I was watching it there, I was thinking, you know what? That fez was clever. That was, that was in out back again, so you know where all the doctors are. I thought that was... that was. I liked the fez. There, yeah, that's going to look... So that's going to look great, mate. <laughs> on the poster, isn't it? The Fez is quite good. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you're writing this stuff, are you the kind of person who kind of has it all planned out with all, you know, bits relating to everything else? Or well, how, how do you plan it all out? I, I, I always keep it in my head. I've got a superstition that I never, uh, I never write a plan down because then you feel obliged to stick to it and that can be the worst thing you do. Uh, but obviously with a story like that, I had to know an awful lot about how it was all going to look together at the end. But you really kept that all up, up, upstairs? Well, it's the only thing I was thinking about. It wasn't that hard. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you have a good idea, you remember it. If your idea wasn't any good, you will forget it. Me memory is a great editor in that respect. And, so and just keep it in your head. And did you always know at some point that you would visit this kind of, this, this kind of this war year, uh, the, the war years that were referred to right no, from the start I, Brussels kind No, of... I absolutely thought we wouldn't do it. I thought that would just always be a set of increasingly insane references, you know, the fall of Arcadia, the battle of Skull, <laughs> whatever nonsense we were coming up with this week. We just sort of wrote in and giggled. I never thought we'd do it. But then I was struggling to think what we could do to bring all the doctors together. I mean, in the past, in the, in the old show, they'd had the doctors coming together to tackle the greatest menace in the history of the universe. You think, well, look, if you've done that, what could it be this time? And the idea of the Doctor uniting to save himself from the worst decision he'd ever taken, I thought, was cool. And I thought it also gave us a real arc for the modern series. It was the story of the man who learned not to be the guy who pressed the button, which I thought I, I liked. I know that some people are really cross that we changed the time, but if you really object to changing time, you may have picked the wrong show. <laughs> <laughs> You created this kind of mini episode with Paul McGann, which yes. was put out before. So, but at one point, we, you were thinking that Paul McGann might be a more pivotal role in this actual story, and at one point, you were talking to Christopher Eccleston as well. Hey, I, originally, and uh, for quite a long time, we were hoping that Chris was going to do it. And uh, that, I think, would have worked. I think Chris, being the sort of tough northern doctor, witnessing the degrees of fay he was about to descend into, <laughs> would have been quite <laughs> funny. And that would have been a useful contrast. Once we didn't have him, uh, we were. Uh, it was my God, it was late in the day. Uh, I mean, the, the smoke was. Yeah, we kept hoping. Yeah. What was yeah. it do you think that made him not go through that? You'd have to ask Chris, but it certainly wasn't any resentment or hatred or Thank misery you. about the show. He was. Uh, he could not have been kinder and more gracious. I, I met up. I met up with him twice. The first time he said, "Look, I only. I'm only meeting up with you because I, I, I want to say to your face why I'm not going to do it. I don't want to do that to my agent or in an email. I want to talk to you and, and talk you through." But I, I, I talked very animatedly for an hour and a half, and he, he, he moved a bit closer and said, can I just have a go? Can I just have a go? Uh, and, and then we had another meeting, and, uh, and he, was, he, he edged a bit closer, and then in the end, he couldn't. I don't think it, it wasn't, as I say, he was as kind and as, uh, and as generous about the show, and obviously still knew the show very well. He was talking about Amy Pond and so on. But he just, for whatever reason, and you'd have to ask him, didn't feel that was the right thing for him to do there. Oh, here he is now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and obviously, you ended up in the end with this kind of sort of conceit, I guess, which was completely not released because you've got the most amazing actor playing the role, but you yeah. created the kind of the war doctor. Well, that was a, a, a moment of, uh, I mean, it was just terror. It was terror. Yeah, yeah. Was it in that place? Was it Century? Century, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what we can do. Yeah. We needed, first of all, another doctor in the mix meant it had to be a doctor who created a contrast. It had to be a doctor that wasn't like the two we had, you know. Uh, and I kept saying, and eventually we did it, obviously if the William Hartnell doctor steps in, that's a real contrast. Um, could we have done the Paul McGann doctor? It never really came up at that stage, but he was, he was the front runner or the forerunner of the romantic dashing doctor. We've had three of them. 
You know, they would have been waiting to the crowds. Uh, what we wanted was uh, the ideal for me uh, was the idea that uh, it would be someone who sort of voiced the old show, even though they weren't in it. You know, so that he could be the John Hurd, could be the voice of the past, saying, "Stop doing that with your screwdriver; it is patently ridiculous." Um, so that he could do all that and could represent that. So you needed someone who was, you know, an icon, someone who was famous in the era that Doctor Who was originally on and when Doctor Who was taken off the air. So someone who you would have wanted above all to play the Doctor in your fondest dreams, you'd imagine this guy could be the Doctor. Someone who was already as iconic as the character of the Doctor automatically is, because they're only going to get that one shot. And we, honestly, we only had the one there. We didn't have enough, we didn't have a backup. Uh, it was the fantasy idea. Like, and so we kept yeah. saying, well, if you could get John Hurt, that would be good. So let's... That's what I suppose we should ask John Hurt. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, to, and it was a weekend, and, yeah. and Anwen Hurt is here somewhere. Yeah, and, she's in the back over there. Uh, hello. Uh, it was actually Anwen who persuaded John, I think, to do it. Thank God. Thank you. <laughs> because that saved the 50th. Although I, I didn't have another idea. Another idea was a glove puppet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's obviously, I know, I know you've been very successful in terms of the kind of cast you've managed to attract to the show, but. That's quite. A, I mean, you know, I mean, there's every possibility you might have said that. Oh, oh God, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was it was an astonishment to me that he, said, that he said yes. I don't think, in terms of the kind of actor who'd be remotely appropriate to play Doctor Who, uh, there isn't anyone grander and more magnificent. I mean, as you know, from you're, you're running this season of John Hurt uh, films, and you you look at all those iconic moments yeah. in cinema history. Thank God, one guy did all of that. Did all of that. So, who else could it? Have? There wasn't another option. And, and, and what did he kind of bring to the role in terms of when he actually sort of arrived and... and, and, and um, it, it, sort of it was like having a, live, it was like a living legend on set. Mm. Um, I mean, we spent a lot of time wondering what Matt and David were going to be like with each other. And actually all that went straight out the window because they were both just in awe. And they used to talk about how they, you know, they'd be jumping around on set, acting their socks mm -hmm. off. And then John would lift an eyebrow and they go, oh, that's how it's done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and did, did, did you get a sense from him how he felt, and, and no disrespect to Stephen's mind, but how he felt about delivering a lot of kind of very kind of complex sci fi kind of lines? Um, I, he, I, he loved the script, and that was one of the things he talked about. He really enjoyed the <laughs> writing. Uh, he would take a, a wee while with it, because, you know, Matt and David were so used to the stuff. There were times when he'd go, sorry, what did you say? And do I say now? But he was brilliant. And the thing is, John just brings utter conviction to everything he does. He, he gave a lovely speech when he finished, saying, you know, I've done these, these big movies. This is hard work. This, this is some of the toughest work I've ever done. And, and the crew just fell in love with him because he, he really, he delivered every time. He was amazing. Yeah, that was brilliant. And it sounds like, you know, sort of from what Anne would have said as well, it meant the world and the idea of kind of becoming this kind of this kind of doctor. He actually now is part of the pantheon of Doctor yeah. Who. He was like quite him. insistent. He was, he was always asking, so I, I am actually Doctor Who. I'm not a yeah. pretend Doctor Who. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just get to be, actually say, I am Doctor Who. Yeah, no, you are. You are definitely a real yeah. Doctor Who. And he only had to do three weeks in Cuthbert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when you're um, showrunner of, of, of Doctor Who, oh, and, the and, and you're <laughs> 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 kind of custodian for the moment, yeah. um, and and you're creating these um, either like a new a new Doctor effectively, or rewriting bits of the Doctor's history, so to speak. Do you have kind of carte blanche to do that, or is there anybody in the BBC saying no, you can't possibly do that? We wouldn't allow you to do that. So, you know, no, how does that work? It's not that kind of job, but I don't know quite why. Because you're always asking, and I know Chris has been through the same. <laughs> In effect, saying, "Is that okay? Can I just do this?" Yes, if you say so. You say, no. oh, come, you on, like. "Come on, give me some, give me some feedback." Can I do? No, I'm just panicking. Um, well, the thing is, they they, they leave Doctor Who alone yeah. to a great degree. I remember when we did uh, back right at the beginning, the Pandora door opens and uh, the big bang, the huge episodes, and Ben Stevenson came to the. Uh, Read through. He said, oh, it's really good. I hadn't read it before now. And I was thinking, we are spending all of this money on this. And I haven't read it. <laughs> OK, fair enough. Uh, so, no, they, you know, they let you go on with it because the... Uh, uh, and that's a very BBC approach. They appoint someone they think is going to make the right decisions and off you go. Not in a, in a welter of power and, uh, and arrogance, but in a sort of, seriously, me? Is no one going to check? Is no one going to mark my work? <laughs> <laughs> 
And um, obviously at the point when this was made, we knew that Matt was leaving. Mm. And obviously Peter had been already appointed and, and there is that moment yeah. where you can't see Do you know what I was thinking this morning what we should have done? We should have cut Jodie's eyes into the... <laughs> <laughs> I thought that. I thought, oh, we could go, we could have done it. We could have had her eyes. That would have been so great. Exactly. Yeah, I remember when this point in this cinema, when we played it on that night, um, how when Peter's eyes come up, there's already lots of cheers and excitement, yeah. but when his eyes came up, there was a massive yeah, yeah. kind of response to that moment, wasn't there? We, we, now you're just thinking, why, why is it a big close up of Doctor Who's eyes? Why? why, why? That's just Doctor Who now. Well, it's true now, yeah. but, but then it was a big deal. Yeah, it was, it was huge. Yeah. And, and from Matt's point of view, obviously, he was kind of preparing. His kind of exit from the show. Do you remember how he was at this point? Well, I remember, what I particularly remember at the point we were shooting this, he was on a massive crash diet for the film he was doing. So I was quite grumpy about the fact he couldn't eat properly during the shoot. But no, I think Matt, because he knew his days were numbered as the doctor, was, he kind of savour every moment. He, you know, by the end of it, he was like, did, oh, did I make the right decision? Did, should I have gone? Yeah, he was. He was really. He was on top form. He was enjoying it. He, you were. You were leaving in the same time frame. Yeah. Yeah. Cinema, yeah. Yeah. I was. I was going. I, I, we, I think. Sometimes I look back at that and go, "Was that the time to go?" But I'm glad that I went with Matt at the end. Mm. Um, Cheers, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you burned us out. <laughs> and and you, you touched on obviously David Tennant coming back and, yeah. and being enthusiastic. And but did he did he take some persuading? And, and then and also about Tom as well. Just was about. What, did you visit them in person, or how did that work? Um, how did it work? Uh, David, I know very well, so I, 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 and he was often around the house. So I, I, I was just sort of saying, "Will you come and do that?" And obviously, when you're when you're around someone's house, you have to say yes. So that was <laughs> but I don't. I think he'd always say, "Look, when it's time to come back and be the doctor again, of course I will." Yeah. And Matt said the same thing. You know, they, they will just do that. They will, and, and, and they always will. I think it was a genuine thought for both Matt and David to stand opposite the face of the Doctor, as far as they were concerned. Because David, as you know, is a big old fan. And, yeah. uh, and had watched all of Matt's episodes. Contrary, by the way, to what Peter Davidson said recently. Matt, uh, David has always watched Doctor Who. Um, uh, he, uh, so he'd watched all of those. And so, so for him, Matt had become the Doctor. And of course, for Matt, David was the Doctor. Yeah. So they had to stand opposite each other. And then they, when they sat in the read-through listening to each other, I remember hearing them saying afterwards, having this sort of, I can't remember the exact words, it was very funny, and it was a shame it wasn't caught on film. Um, so Matt said to Dave, oh, is that how you do that kind of line? I've never hit that right. Oh, and they're sort of exchanging uh, notes on how to talk absolute gobbledygook very fast. <laughs> and, and did you write the role of the creator before you kind of Tom Baker and come the other way around? Um, at the beginning, I think a long time ago, uh, that was, I mean, I think it was... And I think uh, there was some inquiry about whether we would be interested in Tom coming into it. Um, Which the answer was yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, I, think it, I, think, I think this is terribly obvious, but no one's ever really spotted it. Originally, the moment would come back on at the end, Billy Piper's character, and talk to the Doctor and say, well, I think you made the right decision. Yeah. And you could argue that still happens. You can argue that's really the moment in a different disguise. We don't know. Uh, but that was originally do you, what... Do you know? No, I, no, I, no. I don't. Yeah, I, know. I know. Even in the novelization, I make it absolutely clear that there is no clarity. Uh, because I don't know what Chris is going to do in the future, right? So you can't commit too yep. many things, otherwise you're containing the show. Um, you know, obviously the, the heavy implication is this is an old retired version of the Doctor who's uh, trying out his old faces again. And did you have any concerns about the fact that of the previous doctors, you've taken Paul McGann, you've brought in Tom Baker, but the other living doctors went, I mean, they had the five more doctors, whatever it was called, but they mm. didn't make the appearance here properly. Well, well it, was, um, it, was a, it was a difficult one. You can't, for a start, you can't get all of them. There is no possibility of doing the all doctors, no. because some of them just don't return your call. <laughs> just really, it's a total bunch. You can't, you, you, that's not possible. So, so it's possible. going to be the sum of the doctors. So which ones? do you uh, t uh, bring in? Um, some of them don't look at the Doctor anymore. I mean, they, they look magnificent and wonderful, we look at the Doctor anymore. We could do, it, we could do that trick once, I thought, with, uh, with the Tom Baker one. Uh, and he being the oldest and the furthest back in the series was obviously the person to come and visit the show. I didn't know what to do with the other living Doctors. Um, I didn't want to make... There comes a point where it just becomes a stunt. 
you know, you have them playing other little parts, showing up, being a traffic warden, that would just be annoying. <laughs> you know, and, you, and you, there's only so many doctors, frankly, you can have on this show. The right answer is one, trust me, it's yeah. very <laughs> difficult to write one. Um, so, but when Peter Davison was talking to me at uh, it was at some BBC party, he said he wanted to do this fan film, just, just himself with his iPhone, which yeah. he does that kind of thing, for a laugh, about you know, him and the other doctors trying to get in in the act. I said, no, let's, I'll get that properly commissioned and we'll actually make it. So. For me, that is their participation in the show. I don't see what's wrong with that. No. I mean, the, the, the 50th was several different shows. It was Invention Space and Time. It was the Five-ish Doctors. It was it was the Day of the Doctor. It was the Night of the Doctor. I think it's fair enough to say there were a few of them who were a little, little miffed, should we say, that they weren't. I think they mostly yeah. pretended to be miffed, to be absolutely honest. I don't know what. I mean, uh, if you say anything at all or any nature to do with Doctor Who, understand that every single word you say will become a separate article on RadioTimes.com. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes four or five articles out of the same syllable. So, <laughs> trust me, I, 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 know all, I know all the doctors. They're all really nice guys. I saw them quite recently. They're, they're all nice guys. No one's really left. No one's really upset. And you brought back the Zygons, which was yeah. a, 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 a real kind of fan favourite, haven't been... Um, given an outing for many, many years, mm. and, 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 and what was your thinking about, obviously they, they had a very particular kind of set of constraints, shall we say, when they were in the Tom Baker era, and you well, brought them and updated them? <laughs> well, I don't know, I, don't, I think we updated them the least of any. Yeah, I think, but it was pretty uh, fair if it was just doing it again with modern presenting yeah. technology, really. So those originals were amazing. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, I, I remember them. Yeah, yeah give me nightmares when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. So we sort of looked at them and thought, well, there, yeah. isn't, there isn't anything to improve here. Yeah. It's, it's, it's superb. They, they, they deserved another item, and to be absolutely candid, uh, David Tennant really liked Zygons. <laughs> so I brought the Zygons back for David, and he got the snog one. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say fairer than that. I'm <laughs> um, just like a facilitator. <laughs> Strange interest. <laughs> I'm going to see where everybody got a question for you in a moment, but before I do, just sort of as a sort of, now you have kind of walked away from the show. Uh, were there any of the kind of um, classic kind of creatures or characters that you wrestled with bringing back that you either couldn't make work or you just didn't end up doing? Uh, I no, not really. I mean, I, I wish I'd done more with uh, the Autons. I thought the Autons were brilliant. We should have had a, a good old Auton story. I think Chris should do a great Auton story. Not me, Chris, just you. Uh, and uh, but no, not not especially. I mean, I I rated the back catalogue fairly comprehensively. So, uh, not, not especially, um, until I suddenly think of one. The Garm, bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an even scarier dog. <laughs> okay, um, a you, wolf. is there anybody in a wolf? Would anybody like to put their hand up if they'd like to ask questions? Question on the second row back here. Is there anybody else who's got another microphone over there? Anybody? And on the very, very, very back centre, we'll get the second question. Okay. Thank you. Right. Right. So, um, quite a few elements from the Day of a Doctor will turn up late, later series, obviously the Zygon sort of two-part and Evan Center and so forth. What are you sort of thinking when, when writing Day of a Doctor, what consequences it's going to have in future se seasons? Um, I think we're just trying to get finished, are I'm trying to get finished. <laughs> uh, I did, uh, but then I thought, like, actually, if you do, if you bring them to Day of the Doctor, I can, I can make, so I, uh, the whole thing about Osgood, uh, being in uh, two, two Osgoods in Day of the Doctor and Osgood getting killed in uh, Death in Heaven and then coming back as two of them. Uh, that, was, that was all planned through. The, the, the thing you know, that I was landed with Gallifrey being back, in, back again, uh, to me, I just find this funny. I just find it funny because if you watch the old show, you know the truth. He bloody hated the place, right? <laughs> he left it. His entire motivation, his mission statement in life was not... Being on Gallifrey. That was, that is, that was, that's his beginning, that's his origin story. So, who, oh, okay, face back. So he eventually comes back, and I thought, and at the moment I thought that, he'll find it and he'll immediately steal the TARDIS and run away. Because <laughs> he doesn't like it. There's a question right at the very back. Uh, hi, this is a question for Stephen. Um, you mentioned um, that you had a couple of goes at trying to get Chris Eccleston into the story. Um, if he had have accepted, and he was in it, would the story have changed quite dramatically to what it was, or would he have filled? Would it would have been a similar story that you had with John Hurt's character in the Time War and so on? Um, 
It's basically the same story because it's the story of the, uh, the doctor on the day he made the decision uh, in the original version, which you know it exists as uh, two thirds of the script. Uh, it was it was the the ninth doctor, but the ninth doctor actually before we met him, not the ninth doctor with which we were familiar. The you know the uh, the uh, the slightly manic aftermath of that. It would have been the ninth doctor the day before Rose, so to speak. Uh, so it would be slightly different, uh, but it would have been essentially the same, um, because I would argue really quite strongly that the Doctor is the Doctor is the Doctor. So it... And you so go down to the very front here, and um, on the aisle over there. Hi there. Uh, first off, just want to love Day of the Doctor. It's kind of become my sort of go-to cheer-up. It's replaced the Five Doctors long ago. Um, <laughs> my question, and this may be Balderdash I read somewhere, uh, that was that at one point you were planning to revisit Peter Capaldi's moment in there. Was that something that you were planning and was dropped? Or? No, it wasn't. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'd love to hear the word Balderdash again. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, no, I, I mean, how, how do you think? <laughs> there, you know, I'm, look, I, I, I will go to, uh, you know I'll go to the limit of fan intelligence, but my god, having to try and explain uh, to the, the, a general audience, and that's the other 100% of the audience member, why is the Doctor suddenly dashed together if he stumbled into a close-up and only had his eyes in shot? Uh, it, that's too much. That would have been too much. At some point in uh, Peter Capaldi's time, he, he got the call and dashed off and did that, but it's not a story. We've only no. seen that story. So, I, unless, maybe someone else could have thought of something, but I don't. Okay, we've got uh, the aisle there. And then after that, we'll come through to the you know, three rows further. <laughs> Hi, thanks. You see, you said before the the fiftieth wasn't just this; it was all the things that were put, put, put on in in, in twenty thirteen. And we had you know, night of the doctor was it from that. With um, we had this, and then we had Doctor Who the after party. Yeah. How much was that? I'm not going to say impose. Suggested on the on the Doctor Who production team that that might be a thing you'd like to do. Oh, and no, how I, much impact uh, did I you? I conceived and wrote it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, look, I I don't know. I, I I never really paid much attention to that. There's, there's quite an awful lot for us to do. Yeah. Making all the shows we were making. And I remember sitting about there and realising my son was sitting next to me and had watched the entirety of the 3D version of the Day of the Doctor with his uh, glasses upside down. So he was complaining of a headache. I was like, that's bloody surprised, man. Um, and then, they, then, I, then I just wanted to drink. I, I, was, so, I was so clenched. The time I finished, I snapped out. Proctologist off at the knuckle. It was really. I was so retired. Uh, the, uh, uh, like, uh, and then these. Uh, all I wanted was a drink. I wanted. I wanted so much drink. I wanted to see if I could still let any part of my body again. And uh, and they dragged me up, and I sat down there next to John Hurt, one of the grandest and most important people. I'd ever met in my life. Uh, he was being kind and lovely and gentle, and I was humiliated in front of some popular beat combo uh, <laughs> link somewhere else. Tell you a sequel to that. Uh, few, uh, I, I'd given away the punchline, but uh, uh, Sue and I were up late one night and we were watching something important and serious on television, and then realised there was a list show on the other side, so we had to watch that instead. I love list shows. Uh, and, the, uh, and it was TV's most humiliating moment. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, can we watch that? That'll be brilliant. I turned over, and I just, I, I turned down literally to me doing that. <laughs> so, now, it wasn't part of my plan, but you know, it gave people a pleasure. It was funny. When do you get to ja see... Jackie Lane. We got, Jack we got to see Jackie Lane. That was amazing. Oh, well, there you go. But everything you ever wanted. Now, <laughs> <laughs> uh, live in New York at One Direction. <laughs> okay, so, um, after One Direction. Got, um, after it. <laughs> <laughs> and a time loop. Do you remember it? Oh. <laughs> I don't even know where they were. <laughs> okay. Hi, guys. Uh, I can't, I'm not sure if I can speak for everyone, but that's probably like the 15th time I've 
see the day of the doctor, uh, not in a row. <laughs> but it, uh, I don't know if I speak for everyone, but it's never looked more magnificent than it has on the screen. Kudos to you, Stephen and Marcus, and to everyone who worked on the episode, uh, but probably no one more so than John Hurt, of mm. course. Um, uh, Stephen, a bit of a, sorry, I'm shaking a little bit, hope you don't mind. Um, my question is, uh, uh, it's to do with the, the Time Lords in uh, this episode a little bit. Um, it's a rubbish start. Um, uh, in the end of time, you had the High Council of the Time Lords with Timothy Dalton as Rastlan and yeah. all of that going on. Yeah. Um, and so, so I know that part of that would probably take place subsequently with all of that what's going on. Yeah. Um, my question is, where did the idea for the wall, the the war council, the war council, sorry, uh, with Ken Bones and that lot come from? Well, I, I knew that upstairs, Timothy Dalton uh, had another stupid plan, right? <laughs> and that was going on simultaneously with the really stupid plan downstairs. <laughs> so they say, let's drive Gallifrey to planet Earth and go, woo, we're reversing. Oh, me, we're in an oil picture. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of sorting day was that? <laughs> Morning, you? <laughs> um, so what gave me the idea was just well you know I was trying to make it into this seamless garment of continuity the doctor who has always been <laughs> no contradictions or mistakes anyway so I wanted to make sure I don't I don't think, I think the timing's a bit off but uh, I, I'm I, I between you and me it's 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 all made up so it's <laughs> but just that yeah, they must have had a war room mustn't they yeah couldn't have had bonkers people with stupid hats. Or, actually, I'm saying that about Doctor Who. You can always have bonkers people. We've <laughs> got a question in the very, very front row here. And then, oh, and then, um, there's another very, very, very centre back row. Um, a bit further off the last one. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, quite simply, if Chris Tibnall asked you to come back and write a few episodes, would you? Yeah. Um, well, he has, and I haven't. So that would, that would be the. I mean, look. No, here's the, here's the reality. That I've been. Uh, I realise I'm still writing this book at the moment, but I've written an awful lot of Doctor Who. An awful lot. I think I've probably got the record in terms of the television stuff, in terms of minutes. Uh, so two things. One, I do want to go and do other things. He said, not quite finishing Day of the Doctor yet uh, at this panel. Um, so I want to. I certainly want to leave it alone for quite a long while. But also, it's really important for Chris. To have his own vision and to, uh, to move ahead on his version of Doctor Who. You can't have, you can, imagine if I was looming around the place saying, oh, Chris, can I do that a bit? Can I just do, you know, I used to be boss here. Could I have that? No, you can't. You've got, you've got, you've got to let me on with it. So I don't, I think in the short term, and the short term is very long, long I couldn't. And I'd never rule anything out of because I do love it very much, but I've probably written enough of Doctor Who, and Doctor Who's probably had enough out of me. So. Never. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you had the question right at the very, very back there. Uh, yeah, this is for uh, it's two questions to Stephen. Oh, and one thing, in <coughs> 2015, uh, you sent me a Christmas card from the Doctor Who Festival, so I just want to say thank you so much for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, two things. So, Not 2016 or 2017. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a moment of fraud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I just want to ask, so um, two things. Are you ever considering doing any books similar to how Russell did it with his um, The Writer's Tale ever at some point in the future? And also, I um, know you wanted to sort of put the posters in of the Cushing movies in the um, Black Archive. Have you passed that idea on to Chris Chibnall at all? Is there like a sort of little plan in the future? I think if you read the book, you might find it's in there. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know what the joke was, there's a line in there where uh, uh, Kate Lethbridge is leading Clara through the Black Archive. And, and she talks about public knowledge about the Doctor and the TARDIS can have disastrous consequences. And she wasn't meant to be looking at the, uh, uh, the Vortex Manipulator. She's meant to turn and show the two posters, Doctor Who and the Dalek and Daleks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we hold them and then we, uh, we go back to the, the real plot. So uh, I'm delighted. I mean, we couldn't get the, the rights to the yeah, posters. Clearance, yeah. <laughs> Doctor Who can get clearance for Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, that had to go. Sorry. Um, but, uh, but it's back. 
Um, but I like the idea that that's that the Doctor Who movies are inside Doctor Who itself because I know the Doctor would absolutely love those movies. I think they were awesome, <laughs> and he loved being Peter Cushing. You know? He'd think they were improvements. He really would. Um, he'd write fan letters in. Uh, what was the other question? Sorry. Oh, the other question was just: um, Would you ever um, do a book similar to Russell T. Davies on the the, the writer's tale thing? Uh, the writer's tale, which, uh, if anyone's interested in writing in general and Doctor Who in particular, a, a wonderful, wonderful book. You should absolutely go and get it. Uh, it's fantastic. But one of its particular qualities: it was written during the process. I mean, he was writing scripts and sending stuff in, and in the midst of that, so I can't do that now. And anyway, the book already exists. It would just be like a cheap recast. You know, like that sequel where you can't get the star back. Uh, it would be that. See, you don't want that. I'd be like the second Travis and Blake Seven. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't feel a thing. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for two more Thank questions. So the last two questions are there's a hand up just over here, which is the fifth row back, and there's another one on the back there. I will make it through to go for the final one, we'll be down the uh, the aisle here. Yeah. <laughs> Hi there. I was just wondering, as uh, creative people in the industry, what's it like to see your work that came from just ideas in your head to its effect on all the fans that you see before you? Uh, it's the best bit, actually. It's the, after all the work and everything you do there, to see an audience and watch it and enjoy it, it's the best bit. It's the kind of reward for all the late nights still in the room. In the rain and in a feeling cut, feeling covered. I think probably you uh, you don't know what you made until you hear an audience react to it. Is the truth? And, uh, and uh, you know, yeah, I imagine just that everybody here has seen it before. But the first time we sat in here, when all the doctors flew in and there was this huge round of applause, and it was and in the last 15 minutes of it, there was just reactions all yeah. the time. And I remember Mark told me, Mark Gators told me that there was a man just sitting in front of him who was having the best time of his life. He was just, uh, he was just, you know, oh, this is fantastic, this is fantastic. And then when they heard Tom Baker's voice saying, you know, I really think you might, uh, uh, he just went, oh, I can't take it. <laughs> it was too much joy. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the best <laughs> Here at all who had never seen that before in any shape or form? Oh, right. What did you think you were going to see? <laughs> Man for all seasons, are you disappointed? <laughs> um, okay, so the last two questions, um, it was, there, was, there was one further back and the last one beyond the second row back. Is it? I was just wondering, um, how much involvement did you have in the casting of uh, Jodie Whittaker? Me? Uh, uh, sorry, I, I, can't, I can't see where you are. Oh, sorry. I had absolutely no involvement whatsoever. I didn't know uh, that it was Jodie uh, until two days before you did. Um, I knew that a doctor had been cast, but my rule was that I didn't want to know before Peter Capaldi knew. Uh, I thought that was a rule. So I said, until, until he actually knows, I can't be told. So I was the uh, second phone call that Chris made that day. So no, I didn't have, I mean, I've seen what you've seen, uh, uh, and I think, uh, and I've met her, I met her I've, the, the first and only time uh, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and I said, I mean, I absolutely get what, uh, what, uh, what Chris has seen there. Uh, the, uh, you know, the energy, the, uh, the sort of mischief, uh, she's very funny. She's a very funny lady. And I was, I was wondering when, the, when she was first announced, I thought, Brilliant actress, brilliant, but uh, is she a bit serious? Because Doctor Who has to be funny, uh, and she is. So, uh, so I can take absolutely zero credit uh, for most of the good things in life. But, uh, um, uh, but uh, not uh, entirely Chris, entirely Chris. Before we get to the final question, um, I've just got something to say, which is that um, next month, February, we are running a Warris Hussein season here at the BFI, looking at all of Warris's um, films and TV. He'll be here in person on stage on February the 6th. Uh, so um, thank you, Dick. I'll, um, I've done. I've done that. So hopefully we'll see you then. And the final question over here. Thanks a lot, um, Stephen. You said that Doctor Who has always been like the little show that could, and you had free reign to do whatever it was. And it seemed with season ten, you sort of got to indulge yourself and do what you what you wanted to do to give Peter a great send off. Was there a point you ever sort of reached a 
self-control where you said, I can't do that. No way am I going to get away with this or are they going to let me do this? And you thought, oh no, I'll pull back and I won't do that. Well, you just saw that. <laughs> no. I don't think, I don't think, uh, I don't think you can make Doctor Who with a sense of restraint. <laughs> Doctor Who isn't about restraint. Doctor Who is in your face, entertaining all the time. You know, if we could work out how to do a musical number, it'd be in there. Dancing puppies, in there. It's in your face entertainment. So no, it is, um, its mission statement is not to be, st I, I, I'm always saying in tone meetings to everyone's great despair is we are not at home to Mr. Subtlety. We are, we are, we are, we are leaping out that television and we're doing every single damn thing we can think of to get your attention. That's how that show works. Um, so, no, I didn't ever really think in those terms. I mean, I, and I didn't really think that way in my, the way you're talking about in Series 10. I, was, I never really thought about leaving. I just thought, that's just, there's too much to do. You know, you're too busy. You don't think about this being the last time. You think, am I going to survive to the end of this? Uh, so, no, I, didn't, I, didn't, I just, just tried to make good Doctor Who's right up, and, right up until the very last second when... They threw me in the skip and set me up. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's been really great to revisit this so soon and after it. You know, after, after, years, after, mate. Yeah. Five yeah. years. In, in, in the scheme of things, we're looking at 50 years ago. It's yeah. Pretty, but yes, yeah, um, it's five years. Um, and um, a, a huge, huge thank you to both Marcus Wilson and Stephen Moffat for being here.